Uh, Carol, turning to your package there, you talked to Dr. Fauci, and it, it, he makes very interesting remarks. I'm curious to know what other issues did he share with you regarding the Zika virus? Well, we were talking about the fact that someone said they found the mosquito that can carry Zika in the Washington area, and he said that that was inconsequential, as is the virus itself, because Zika does not normally kill people unless it's got, um, unless the person has some sort of compromised immune system and uh, is, has fragile health anyway. Uh, he, he views the virus as inconsequential except for this potential link between Zika and microcephaly. Doctors are also looking at the link between Zika and Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a kind of paralysis. And Josh, turning to you here, one of the issues coming up as you go through the Zika virus, which is an outbreak mainly in South America, we've seen that in Uganda, back in Africa, and we'll get back to one of the doctors talking about that. Mm -hmm. But one of the concerns is once it's diagnosed, since, uh, as Carol talked to Dr. Fauci, there seems to be no vaccine, no really known treatment. Once you're known to have Zika virus, what do you do next? What kind of treatment actually is available? Well, um, as you said, there really is no treatment available right now. So um, it really depends on who you are if you are diagnosed. And, and, the, and the danger, as Carol was saying, is for pregnant women. And uh, so if you are a pregnant woman who is diagnosed with Zika, uh, that would be the time to speak with a medical professional, uh, perhaps confirm the test if it already hasn't been confirmed, uh, and discuss your options. But treatment, unfortunately, is not one of them. But the status can be monitored. The infection itself doesn't cause any serious complications to the person infected except for this link to uh, birth defects. And so uh, it, it really is uh, pregnant women who are at risk here. Uh, others may be infected, uh, but if you're not a pregnant woman, the, the, that link to uh, this birth defect uh, you don't have to worry about the serious complications. We'll get back to that definitely because one may want to know what happens to the child that is, you know, has microcephaly. I mean, once the sonogram is done and you know that your child is infected, what do you do next? But then, uh, Dr. Ron, let's uh, get to you. And we've heard about uh, cases of sexually transmitted uh, Zika virus now. Uh, how, w what more do we know about this and how can that be prevented? We know very little. It can be prevented by practicing safe sex, but I think it's important to say from the outset that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this is a mosquito-borne disease primarily. There have been a few cases, one of which is fairly well documented of sexual transmission, but the uh, feeling on the part of public health authorities now is that this does not represent and will not represent a very important mode of transmission, that in the long run, what we have to do is concentrate on what are the majority, the vast majority of cases which are transmitted by a mosquito from one infected person to another susceptible person. Is gender an issue here? That even a man has the Zika virus, is the one likely to transmit this to the woman, or does it go both ways? I, I don't know, we don't know. We don't know yet. As Dr. Fauci said, there are many, many unknowns that need to be investigated that should be investigated in the very short term future and many of the appropriate studies in fact have already begun. Carol, you did talk to Dr. Fauci about microcephaly. Uh, I don't know if he gave you some insight into what happens because we know here in the US once you are pregnant and you do the sonogram, sometimes they tell you the child is not safe and you have the option of do I, you know, abort or what happens next? Did he give you any insights into the microcephaly? Well, factor? I also I also mm -hmm. talked to mm -hmm. the medical director of the March of Dimes which is an organization that has worked to prevent birth defects. And uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Edward McCabe both said that, you know, they think the most critical part is in the first trimester if a woman gets Zika, but they haven't done enough studies to know, you know, if that is in fact true, but that's when the baby's brain is developing. And the reason the baby has a small head is because the brain has stopped developing at some point. Now, you can have a small head. In fact, we were talking about this before the show. You can have a small head, but have normal or even superior intelligence. And the March of Dimes recommends that, that these babies be fully evaluated by 
competent professionals, and then if they need physical therapy, speech therapy, some, they have developmental delays. If they need any kind of therapy, it's best to start it very early on so that the baby has the best chance of becoming as fully functioning a person as that child can become. Josh, if you may weigh in on uh, the challenges probably facing most of South America uh, where the Zika virus has been uh, found, uh, I would think it's very similar to some of the challenges that we face from the African continent where most people don't have access to health. And so I'm just wondering what really do governments need to know? What should they put in place to be able to at least contain the spread of the virus? Yeah, we're in an unfortunate situation in that uh, we have so many unknowns as we've heard. Uh, one of the problems that we have is that we don't have a good test to diagnose Zika uh, easily and rapidly. Uh, so it's very difficult to know exactly how many cases are in a country or in a location and how quickly it may be spreading, although we have a general sense that it has spread rather quickly across Latin America. Um, so. Governments uh, right now are really focusing on, on several things. Uh, one, doing a better job of, of surveillance, setting up some studies to make sure that this link between Zika infection and microcephaly uh, is, is a real link and providing some, some more evidence to that link, um, as well as providing uh, recommendations uh, on, on how people can uh, prevent uh, mosquito bites and therefore prevent being infected in the first place. Uh, and setting up mosquito control programs, uh, stepping up those control programs, and also doing some public uh, health education programs. Uh, and we've seen those kinds of efforts happen across Latin America. And uh, should Zika rise up as a real problem in the African continent, I would expect the same to be true. Mm -hmm. Esther, if yes. I can, I was wondering if our guests would know. I mean, when you compare the health facilities in West Africa, Liberia, mm -hmm. Sierra Leone, and uh, Guinea, during the Ebola outbreak, when we know that hospitals didn't have electricity, didn't have necessarily running water, there weren't enough treatment facilities, I mean, it, it, and they had just come out of long wars. But compare this to Latin America and the Caribbean, where there haven't been wars, where the language is the same. I mean, they have a common language in Spanish. And, and what it, is that helpful in, in um, hunting down the Zika virus. I, I would think, Dr. Ron, you've done some studies uh, relating to WHO findings and how they, were, they treated the Ebola virus in West Africa. Probably you can give us an insight into what Carol is uh, referring to. Well, first of all, Latin America, like Africa, is not one thing. It's a very diverse and very heterogeneous uh, geographical area. Uh, it has um, many rich countries. It has some of the poorest countries in the world, in, in the Caribbean. It has uh, rich people and poor people within each country. There are tremendous inequalities within the country. So while it's true that most people do have very limited access to health care and are the most vulnerable, therefore, to, to the consequences of diseases like Zika, there are also very good facilities. So I think to say can we compare the Ebola affected areas to South America? It, it, it's difficult to say. In some levels we can, in some levels we cannot. That said, I want to make sure, I'd like to make sure that people understand that the problem with this disease is not the disease itself. And in fact, the World Health Organization has not declared Zika virus disease to be a public health emergency of international concern. They have declared the cluster of microcephaly that was detected in northeastern Brazil to be a public health emergency of international concern. That's why there's so much focus on trying to establish this association. That cluster of cases in Brazil would be an emergency whether or not it turns out to be caused by the Zika virus. It's conceivable that after the studies are done, there might be a different cause mm -hmm. identified. We don't know for sure. Yeah, the yeah, disease yeah. itself, as has been said here and as Dr. Fauci said, is not a very serious thing for adults. It's a short term. It lasts at the most a week. It's a uh, virus that causes a... Um, a, a headache, a rise in temperature or fever, a fleeting rash uh, all over the body, 
joint pain, and after about a week, the symptoms subside. There have been no deaths from Zika virus disease itself. There have been no deaths recorded. I think it's important that people understand that and that the problem that we're facing is understanding more what the consequences of this disease might be, whether they be the congenital malformations that might be microcephaly or whether it be what's called Guillain-Barre syndrome, a immune system attack on a person's nervous uh, on a person's nervous system that results in paralysis and that if it paralyzes the muscles that are important for breathing can result in the death of a person.